You're watching MCTV, Millbrae Community Television. Hi, everyone, and welcome, and thank you for your patience as we were just setting up for a moment. Uh, but we're very, very happy to have you here and want to welcome you to this event. We've been planning for a while now, and many of you sitting in the audience have been part of planning it as well. So I'm uh, Lisa Peshkakote, and I'm with the League of Women Voters in Palo Alto. And I and some others in the audience have been planning and organizing this for a while. Our other key co-sponsor is the Palo Alto PTA Council, um, who also very kindly, along with the school district, gave us this beautiful venue to use. And our other co-sponsors are here, uh, other League of Women Voters in the Bay Area, as well as the AAUW, the American Association of University Women, uh, for Palo Alto. So we're all very happy that you're here and hope it'll be a great program. So to start with, I'm gonna give a quick overview of what we're gonna do and then a few practical things and then we'll launch into the meat of the program. So just bear with me for probably about five minutes as I do kind of the overview. So I think many of you know about the League of Women Voters. We're about voting rights and information for voters, nonpartisan, nonprofit, and that's what the League kind of does. Our big focus this year nationally for the League is around making democracy work. And that's, that's kind of our trademark logo for the year. And there's so many things that go into that, but one thing that goes into that is informed voting. So getting information for voting. And that's what tonight's topic is about. So I totally recognize that when we make our decisions, including election decisions, a lot of different things go into that. Facts are part of it, but it's our beliefs, our family, our peers, our friends, our culture, all, all sorts of things go into it. But a foundation and, and kind of underneath all that is what information do we have that we can use to make our decisions, whether it's voting or anything else. And that was the reason for tonight's event is in this world where we have so much information, all different kinds of platforms, all different kinds of ways, are there some practical things that we could learn that would help us as we, as we just go our daily lives as information consumers? So that's what this is about. Let me cover a few just practical things first. Uh, the fire exits, um, like being on a plane, there are, there are two here, two out there where we came in, two upstairs. So just note that restrooms are back out in the lobby to the left. And uh, we are recording this event. Dana Sahe, very kindly from Millbrae Community TV. Uh, they're very graciously doing this for us for free so that we'll have an event recording that can be rebroadcast later and hopefully also shared with the League of Women Voters across the US. There may be others that will want to play this event that aren't lucky enough to get to live next door to our wonderful speakers. Um, as far as the handouts, you should have three things that you got at the table as you came in. One is a handout with some tips and tools, a legal size, two-sided piece of paper. That's to take home, it's just a good reference sheet. There's a feedback form that we would appreciate your completing before you leave and just drop it back out where you got it. And then there are also some index cards. We're gonna use them for the questions that we have in the audience. I will take written questions and some of our volunteers will come and pick them up once or twice during the event. So please pass them to the end of the aisle and then we'll deal with the questions at the end of the event, whatever time we have for that. So let me go back to the, um, the, the Wi-Fi and the wireless, sorry, that is available. There's a guest Wi-Fi available in the building. You don't have to connect, but if, as the speakers are talking about some practical examples, you want to check something, you're welcome to. There should be both the guest Wi-Fi that's free and wireless, you just need to sign up for the Wi-Fi, but it's not required. And even though you may wanna do that, please make sure all the noises are off. So all, all your phone noises and any other noises are off for the audience, but also for the recording. So coming to the program, uh, we have some great experts here uh, from many different aspects of the topic we're talking about. We'll get some practical examples, hopefully from each of them, with the idea of setting the stage of what's happening here, especially in the context of democracy and voting. Again, nonpartisan, this is just general information. And then very specifically, what are some practical things that we as information consumers can take out and use after this event?
So with that, I'm going to introduce our first speaker, who's also our moderator, uh, Sam Woolley. Uh, Sam Woolley is with the Institute for the Future, which until I met Sam, I didn't know what it was, but it's actually headquartered here in Palo Alto, and it's a 50-year-old think tank. And we're very fortunate to have Sam. He's the head of what's called the Digital Intelligence Lab at the Institute for the Future. And his specialty, he's worked in many places in, in Europe and Oxford around this topic, but his particular specialty is around computational propaganda. And I think Sam's going to say a little bit about what that's about. Um, but again, he does a lot in this area, also around automation, political communication, and what's called information warfare, which I think we've all seen. At a later time near the end, Sam's also going to offer to potentially do another seminar for us later about some very interesting work he's been doing with the State Department and Congress, but we'll cover that at the very end. So now I will hand over to Sam. Thank you very much. So, thank you. Right. Actually, you don't need that. I don't need it. Yeah, you don't need I it. I don't need it at all. So, all right. Thank you. Hello. Well, now you know everything about me. Uh, welcome. Tonight we are going to talk about information, which has been the topic of much discussion for the last year or so. For me, it's been the topic of discussion for several years. Um, I started studying what I call computational propaganda about five or six years ago. Uh, the goal for me was to understand the way that social media might be leveraged for political control or for sending out propaganda as much as it was being used for democracy. And so what I realized really quickly was that there was a lot of people around the world, especially powerful political people, who are becoming really savvy to the idea that you could use social media as a conduit for the manipulation of public opinion. And that was scary to me. So uh, what my team and I set out to do was to understand exactly how this manipulation was happening and where it was happening and who was doing it. And what we quickly realized was it was super complicated. <laughs> we, uh, we, we studied all of the countries around the world. So we looked at the United States and the United Kingdom and Canada and Mexico, but we also studied um, Iraq and Iran. And we looked at South Korea. We looked at uh, Russia, Ukraine, Taiwan. And every single country we looked at, we found that invariably the internet was being used in some way, shape, or form to try to control the flow of manipulation. And if you zoom back and you think about it, that's kind of a no-brainer because the internet is media. It's a medium, it is media, like anything else. It's just that it's a lot more complicated than TV or radio. It's all of those things in one, right? So the idea that people would try to control us via the internet, yeah, makes sense. The question was, what happened during elections? What happened during security crises? What happened during uh, natural disasters? Because during those times, people were really vulnerable. And we wanted to make sure that people knew what was going to happen in these times. We're in an era when fake news is a buzzword. And a, every side, each side, every side, uses it in a way that's almost like weaponized against one, against one another. It's basically like saying, what you're saying is subjective. But tonight, I think that we're here to remind you that facts do exist. And that facts and truth might sometimes be at odds. What we feel is true is often different from what scientific facts say. And so as a social scientist, I want to tell you a little bit about what we're going to hear tonight. Uh, and I'll give you a little bit of a footnote on what I think about where we're going. So today we're going to hear from five different individuals. And I'll introduce each of them as they come up. But we're going to hear about what individuals can do about fake news and the spread of dis and misinformation, how you can actually make your vote informed. We're going to hear framing about how we got to now in the United States. What happened here? What happened uh, with the confluence of data, social media, politics, and society? We're going to hear from Facebook about why you see what you see, and Google about why you see what you see, and about election integrity, and about fact-checking. 
We're gonna hear about education and young people and what it takes to help young people to understand what's true versus what is false. This is really exciting because there's a lot of talk, but very little clarity right now, especially in the news. And I think that that's happened for a variety of different reasons, but I think that what we wanna to do tonight is shed some light. We've never seen a time that is more important than now for the, the job, the profession of fact checking. But I wanna tell you that in my conversations with journalists, they also don't know what to do all the time, by any means. And fact checking looks a lot different on the internet when, when information is coming real time, when propaganda spreads virally and really quickly than it did 25 years ago. So we've got to use nuanced tools. I think that the companies, Google, Facebook, Twitter, Reddit, are part of the solution, and they want to be part of the solution, and that's why they're here tonight. I think we also need people who are independent voices, who can criticize and comment in a way that is constructive. And I think that we need to avoid being scared. I think that we need to know that the facts are out there, and that if we persevere, that we will find them and that they will triumph. And so the idea tonight that I wanna to leave you with is the idea that we need to build our technology for democracy. And so moving forward, let's think about how we do that. I'm gonna, thank you. I'm gonna introduce our first speaker. Our first speaker, speaker is Sarah O. Oh. Sarah is a visiting scholar at the Center for Information Technology Research in the Interest of Society, otherwise known as Citrus, at UC Berkeley. Sarah, take it away. Go off of. Great. Um, hi, everyone. How many of you check Twitter? Um, how many of you checked Twitter after the last earthquake that we re recently experienced in the Bay Area? A few hands. How many of you uh, went online to see what had happened and did a Google search or online search? Okay. Um, the internet has become such an important place for all of us to find information, especially during crises uh, and big events um, like earthquakes. I've been reading in some of the research that I've been doing about case studies around how online conversations develop and grow around events like earthquakes. Um, I was just looking at the report on the 2014, uh, 2014 earthquake in South Napa. Does this picture look familiar? It was widely publicized um, around the time of 6.0 magnitude. And uh, immediately, as you can imagine, um, Napa earthquake trended on Twitter, Napa EQ. And anyone who was watching Twitter and following the story could see a few hashtags trend. Um, as the hashtags started popping up and conversations started to develop as reports were coming out and photos like this were coming out, uh, we also saw photos of mutilated bodies and uh, reports about American misconduct uh, in the Middle East uh, and uh, content that was not in English. And um, some observed that there were groups and individuals and accounts that were not in the United States that were using the Napa earthquake hashtags. I don't know if any of you saw these. Um, the city of Berkeley reported in, in one of the reports that I was reading um, that after realizing that some of these tweets were not coming from California, um, they observed that media monitors were able to filter out some of the tweets that were geotagged, meaning tweets that showed where they were being tweeted from. Um, so for those media monitors who saw, for example, this tweet with this graphic photo was not from California. They were able to filter that out of the search that they were doing to try to understand what people were saying and what the conversation was. 
I love that example because it's a very simple, practical thing uh, that was done in a moment of crisis when people were trying to respond, figure out what the situation was, and concerned citizens were trying to understand what was unfolding and what was happening. Um, this is the exact scenario that I've seen all around the world in the work that I've done with communities who've been very worried about hashtag hijacking, propaganda, false information, fake news, and online hate speech. The lens through which I've looked at uh, most of this work has been in Southeast Asia, um, where uh, social media is a critical lifeline. Um, the first place people go to for news, I, many Americans are increasingly turning to social media for news. In Southeast Asia, it's, it's the place. It's imagine if you had every newspaper that you read plus all your social media outlets on one platform. That's the experience that a lot of the uh, audiences that I was working with had in that region. Uh, and I also have done a lot of work in the Western Balkans where um, there are concerns not only about Russia and uh, domestic forces that are trying to hijack conversations there, but also terrorist groups such as ISIS and their supporters uh, trying to influence public opinion and shape um, news and how it's received. So in these environments, it's, it's challenging to push back. Um, they may not have savvy media monitors who are employed to follow conversations. Um, it may be really hard to know um, what, what credible sources of information could potentially mitigate any confusion about what's happening. Uh, it's very hard to access um, some of the decision makers that might be able to help them in moments of crisis. And in some places, there's no credible sources of information at all. Um, independent media is struggling in a lot of the countries where I worked. So the perspective that I, I bring to thinking about how to push back on false information and propaganda is in an environment where fake news can mean life or death. And there are very few institutions to fall back on. So the uh, thought exercise that I went through in preparing for this um, talk today was thinking through what were the four or five or six things that really seemed to work for the groups, the activists, the journalists, and the community leaders who were trying to protect their communities against hijacked conversations, false information, and dangerous narratives. At the highest level, they all have to do with how humans interact with information. You'll hear today from uh, the platforms about um, better ways to engage uh, online on specific platforms. Um, fact checkers, as Sam mentioned, look at how they can promote better content on their, um, through their specific publications. But I'd encourage you and I'd invite you to zoom out and think about what on a human level and as individuals can we begin thinking about to begin cracking this problem and think about how we build resilience as a community to deal with specific attacks around disinformation, to deal with rumors and dangerous narratives. Um, I am here because I'm encouraged by some of the work that I saw. It's, uh, as I mentioned, very challenging, but um, there are some fundamental basic strategies and tips that I saw um, while I was doing this work abroad. So I'm here to share just a few of them with you. Um, so the first is thinking about how we engage. Um, so the first is thinking about how you engage with information in and of itself. The first step that we, do, we took in designing any program or considering any threat was doing an assessment of our own media diet. Uh, how many of you track your food intake and think about what you're eating on a regular basis? Great. Uh, think about how you might approach your information diet in the same way. I use MyFitnessPal and I keep track of what I eat and I'm always surprised at the end of the week to see how poorly I did. You know, I, I, know, what, 
I know what healthy food is, and I know why it's good for me, um, but at the end of the week, I always have a pie chart that shows that I ate you know, way more chocolate chip cookies than I thought I had. Uh, but it's that process of tracking that data and taking a look at it that allowed me to see that my habits weren't necessarily aligned with the values that I cared about or the goals that I had. Um, there are some researchers at MIT who've looked at different methods for doing this and looking at how you individuals on a very micro level consume information and they've found that this is a really powerful way to self-reflect and evaluate on your own media consumption habits. And we found that this was the first step to figuring out what is the information that's reaching people and how do we begin to think about how to influence that? The first step starts with figuring out where you're receiving your information from. The second is a very simple one. Um, when uh, you think about how false information spreads or how rumors begin to proliferate in the environments that I talk about, we saw that there were simple behaviors that individuals were taking that they weren't always aware of. So we've kind of done a media assessment. We sort of know how people are engaging with information and media. And then we looked at some of the small behaviors that seem to encourage uh, rumors to grow very quickly or rapidly or lead to some very dangerous outcomes such as violence. Um, there's really interesting work that's been done about sharing. Uh, so very briefly, if you look at the research on rumors, uh, researchers have found that the number of times someone repeats a certain piece of information really influences how people engage with it. If you hear something once, you know, you might brush it off, especially if it's outlandish and hard to believe or uh, it, you might question the credibility of what someone's saying. If you hear it twice, it's more likely that someone might be able to recall it, and you know, it's kind of somewhere floating around in your brain. If you hear something three times, people are more likely to think that that fact or that statement might be true, even if it's not, even if there's been no evidence presented, just by the um, uh, scale of engagement with that piece of content can lead people to believe it's true. So one of my favorite campaigns that I was able to support was something called Think Before You Share. And that was a very, again, very simple but um, powerful way to encourage people to begin to think about their, not only how they're receiving and engaging with information, but how they're interacting with it. This is also useful uh, to avoid some of the trends that we've seen emerge around cry wolf scenarios or alert fatigue if uh, there is information circulating, especially in a vulnerable time, uh, things can escalate very quickly. So uh, in the campaign, we encouraged people to pause and reflect and in a mindful way, think about how they were engaging with that information. Um, the third thing, so if we are thinking about this as going up in, a scale of engagement, uh, we started with thinking at a very basic level how we're engaging with information, how we're interacting with engagement. The third piece that was really powerful was thinking about where people go if they have a problem or a event um, that turns out to have very negative consequences around a rumor or specific information. The role of community leaders and influencers is really important and powerful in this. So the third thing, uh, as we're thinking about how we as a community in the Bay Area think about how we're uh, protecting ourselves and becoming more aware about these trends and problems, um, I would say think about where the influencers and the communities that you engage with are. Whether it's online and there's uh, an online community that you see as an authority and source of credible information, or offline in your communities. Um, one of the most effective ways to actually counter 
false information and rumors online was to mobilize communities offline that were able to very quickly disseminate correct information or work with um, local journalists to dispel some of the rumors that were coming out. Again, these are very basic things, and when you say them out loud, it sounds so straightforward, but I would invite you to think about how uh, you're seeing these things exist or uh, gaps that you see in your communities as you think about how you're engaging with information. Uh, and then the last thing, again, this is related, but um, when there's information that is promoting or false information that's promoting something that is potentially dangerous or scary, um, we found that the direct responses saying that wasn't true or saying um, that that information should not be believed were ineffective. The most successful messages and responses to false information and rumors that we saw was always presenting an alternative or presenting a new idea or presenting another way for individuals to engage with that story or that content. So think about as you, again, assess where you're getting your information, where you can go to to resolve a question about credibility, what are the other factors in your community that might allow you to develop a um, alternative option if there's something uh, dramatically false or incorrect coming up in your community about an issue that you care about. Uh, to go back to earthquakes, uh, I think about this a lot as building a, a toolkit for preparedness. I mean, the first thing that we do when we uh, have a big earthquake is go out and buy an earthquake quit kit from CBS to prepare for the next one. Uh, these are just some of the small things that I've seen work very effectively at a very basic individual and community level in places where uh, false information and rumors have had um, very serious consequences. So these aren't um, silver bullet answers. I think all of us uh, that you'll hear from us today will say that there are no silver bullet answers, but there are very basic small things that we can do in the same way that we uh, prepare earthquake preparedness kits to prepare for the next um, big disaster. So I'll end on that and share that I think um, the trends that you'll hear about in international contexts are very relevant for our discussion today and thinking about the influence of these trends in our democracy. Um, more than isolated incidents or unique cases, I, I think they're much more of a canary in a coal mine situation. And we're already seeing the same strategies and tactics be used in our democracy that have influenced politics and conversations abroad. So I think there's a lot of relevance to the experiences that we've seen in other places and would invite you to engage um, with those experiences, but think about how it affects you and your community on a, on a much more basic local level. So with that, I'll end there. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Sarah. I think that the, real, the thing that really struck me there um, amongst all of it was that we should be thoughtful about the information we consume. Uh, my wife always tells me, you should try to be an, uh, an information omnivore. And I'm like, what does that mean? But she says, you should read the New York Times, but you should also check out Fox. And I'm like, do you actually do that? And she actually does. Uh, and so with that, I'm going to introduce our next speaker, someone who is an information omnivore, Renee DiResta, the head, of public, or the head of policy for data and democracy and a Mozilla fellow in media, misinformation and trust. Take it away, Renee. I'm gonna plug in here. Thank you all for coming tonight. So I'm Renee DiResta, head of policy at Data for Democracy and a Mozilla fellow in media, misinformation and trust. Um, what this means is that I've spent uh, the last couple of years looking at the problem of disinformation um, across multiple types of actors and multiple types of systems. And, um, and what I am here to talk to you about today is thinking about elections in this context. So disinformation isn't actually limited to um, elections. It's uh, an issue that often is uh, something that develops over time. Um, and so I'm going to start by 
framing it in this particular capacity in uh, ways that we rely on people to be informed in the pushback against misinformation, particularly in the era of uh, technological systems that make it very easy to reach people uh, to spread false narratives. So we are starting with 2016. Uh, so post-truth was named the 2016 word of the year by Oxford dictionaries. You know, <laughs> other things in the running probably were alternative facts and a couple of other uh, choice phrases that basically um, uh, highlight for us the fact that in 2016 in particular we saw a phenomenal amount of false information displayed across all types of media. And so I think it helps to define uh, the term, you know, post-truth is a great term because it encompasses the environment in which disinformation, misinformation, and hoaxes have become prevalent. But disinformation, misinformation, and hoaxes are actually three different things. So as Sarah was, uh, was discussing, the notion of misinformation, initially, when you have a situation like an earthquake, you'll have somebody who will tweet something or post something that's simply incorrect. They got it wrong. This is the kind of thing journalists do this. Also, you see it the sort of fog of war problem. Um, information in a breaking, evolving, um, tumultuous environment is sometimes simply wrong. And misinformation is uh, lends itself to be corrected by fact checkers because it's usually both created by and spread by people who have really good intentions. This is very different than disinformation, which is a term that we use and that I'm going to use sort of throughout to talk about deliberate attempts um, to seed false narratives or to make people believe an incorrect thing. And that's because disinformation is usually something that's spread by one group that is targeting another group with the intent of making them believe something that's either not factually accurate or uh, is, is highly uh, provocative or highly swaying or to spread a narrative that's particularly divisive. And propaganda is sort of a tactic um, in a disinformation campaign in an information war. So that's the sort of hierarchy um, that we use when we think about this stuff. Propaganda just means information with an agenda. So it is uh, something that can be spread by governments, but it can also be spread by corporations or by people. Um, propaganda in a disinformation campaign is content that's put out to make people believe a particular thing. So all of these have been sort of rolled up under the name fake news. Um, and the environment that we're in now, the sort of post-truth era, is also coming to encompass an era in which fake audio and manipulated video uh, are kind of coming into their own. So I'm going to talk a little bit about why this is and how we got there. Um, so there are structural issues, and then there are geopolitical issues. And so uh, I'm going to, to touch on both. Um, so social networks in particular have made it very easy to reach vast numbers of people incredibly easily. Uh, and that's because the thing that makes them so powerful is that they connect us. And any propagandist needs an audience in much the same way that any advertiser needs an audience, which is why if you build a system that connects large numbers of people, particularly, uh, and, and makes them reachable and accessible, unfortunately, you've also created a tool that's extremely appealing to uh, propagandists and bad actors. So this is the problem of misuse. Uh, since everyone is connected on the internet and everyone is um, very, very frequently on the internet, I noticed there weren't a lot of folks on Twitter here um, but, uh, but in general, you know, Facebook is a, is a great connector. People spend a lot of time on YouTube getting social in the channels. If you're a gamer, there's Discord and Twitch. I mean, there's an entire ecosystem of platforms um, by which people can connect. So um, this means that there are also captive audiences to be found everywhere because these are kind of standing communities. And so this means that whether it's a Twitter hashtag or a, a Reddit, you know, subreddit, community or a Facebook page or a Facebook group, um, these are environments where people tend to connect a little bit more uh, permanently in the digital era. So we should all be aware by now that social network activity does shape opinions. Um, and as a result of the way that people are exposed to information, as Sarah pointed out, it does help to solidify or inform opinions. Um, the net kind of result of this is that the real world implications as those opinions are shaped are that people can begin to have particular perceptions of certain policies, for example. Um, and then unfortunately, as we see in extreme cases, uh, it actually has the potential to destabilize democracy. Um, democracy is dependent on an informed electorate, and if the electorate is receiving vast quantities of misinformation or um, hate speech or you know, what we see sometimes in uh, parts of the world that are not the US, ethnically divisive 
um, speech, these are the sorts of areas where those societal fractures uh, can actually negatively impact the way that people engage with their neighbors. So the power to influence opinions increasingly lies with those who can most widely and effectively disseminate a message. And we used to say that you know we're in an era in which people are connected on platforms that make advertising very easy. Uh, everything has become kind of a marketing campaign. I did a lot of work on SB 277, which was the vaccine law, and we ran ads on Facebook, and we uh, you know kind of grew a grassroots group on Facebook. And so, it's a phenomenal tool for activism. And that's because social networks have been designed specifically to facilitate sharing. So if I can reach a collection of people who are interested in my particular point of view about something, in this case it was a vaccine law, um, they likely have friends who are sort of sympathetic to my point of view also, and so they will organically take the content that I'm putting out to them, and then they in turn will spread it uh, to their network. So the distribution, um, the platforms are designed to facilitate the sharing because it benefits them for a number of reasons. Some of it is in terms of engagement. They keep their own user base active and, and happy and engaged. They feel um, they're seeing compelling content that's interesting to them. Uh, it also benefits advertisers, which is how they make their money. Um, and it, so it's this kind of one-two punch that says that it's both uh, more enjoyable for the user to have these tools to facilitate rapid sharing, and it's also better for the advertisers because it helps uh, their charge less when their content reaches more people through organic spread as opposed to simply paying uh, to reach each person. So this is where the notion of paid ads is one small piece of it, but organic content and the way that we share information uh, is actually the really critical thing to be talking about here, particularly when we think about the fact that um, what this means is that the power to influence opinions lies with the group that's most adept at getting the message out, even if they're very, very small. So when Sam was introduced, the, uh, I believe the concept of manufactured consensus was mentioned. And so one of the challenges when we think about how information spreads around social ecosystems uh, is that bad actors who have a lot of fake accounts uh, can masquerade as real people. And so that is how uh, either very, very small groups of people or small groups of fake people uh, can actually have serious reach, their information can, can get out there and reach real people who then in turn spread it to their communities. And so this is how the, the problem begins to propagate and why uh, ideas about uh, information integrity are kind of the um, core to our discussions, particularly as we think about the information environment and the election season that we're moving into. So uh, bots and automated accounts on Twitter, for example, can be programmed to repeat inaccurate or incendiary talking points. Sarah mentioned the notion of hashtag spamming, where people are pushing an unrelated message into a hashtag. Um, you'll also see people pushing, um, you know, in the tragic cases of mass shootings, this happens very often, people will name uh, people who are not actually the shooter, but unfortunately, uh, by the time that information is corrected, um, the poor person who was misidentified uh, finds themselves the recipient of having their entire internet life um, assessed and, and, and analyzed and pushed out to the masses. Uh, you'll see it returned, unfortunately, in search results if search is taking too great a signal from social chatter. Uh, so this is an example of how, unfortunately, influence and disinformation dissemination are systemic. Things hop from platform to platform to platform. Um, and so if you know what we say a lot of the time uh, with when we talk about Sam's issue of manufactured consensus, if you can make it trend, you make it true. Because unfortunately, for certain moments in time, if I go and search for the name of, uh, you know, of, of someone um, in, in involved in a mass shooting, for example, the results that are going to return to, that are going to be returned to me are going to confirm um, that initial fraudulent misconception, and it's going to take a while uh, for the internet to kind of catch up and fix that problem. So this is the problem of what is popular or what is rapidly shared or what is incendiary. Incendiary content is much more likely to be reshared. People really respond to righteous indignation, to rage. Uh, there are a couple of interesting studies that say that a lot of the most popular articles that get tweeted around a lot and shared a lot are also the ones that are like really not the ones that are most widely read. Like they're not actually reading the content, they're reading the headline and then hitting the share button. And so this is how uh, the problem of popularity um, for a long time has resulted in, um, this was the problem of clickbait that social platforms really had to get in there and try to create signals by which um, they took into account whether or not the person sharing the content had actually read the article before deciding to share. Um, in the era of what we call zero cost publishing, anyone can write whatever they want. 
So nailing the distribution channel is often a lot more important than actually being factually accurate because if you can make it trend, you can make it true. So if you can create content that people are going to find really appealing, that's going to have that one sentence about your message, that one kind of um, core piece to the propaganda, you can get it out there if you game the system well enough. Uh, there are no gatekeepers, really, that, that fact check. You know, we have kind of democratized um, access to dissemination channels. And the, while that has had wonderful positive benefits in terms of opening up people who didn't previously have a reach or have a voice and, and helping them find an audience, the flip side of that has been that there is no editorial oversight, no fact checking. And so the kind of stuff that wouldn't make it to the front page of your newspaper uh, can, in fact, make it front and center and be shared by hundreds of thousands of people on a social platform. Um, so I'll talk really briefly about election 2016. Uh, so I was one of the people who did the research on looking at the, um, tracking the, the Russian content from platform to platform to platform. And this was uh, during a period in early 2016 when the social platforms themselves didn't really have um, the most informed perspective on what it was that was happening. <laughs> and that's because, um, one of, the, one of the things that we see as third party researchers is, is we can gauge the health of the system, uh, meaning we can see where content emerges in like a very small coordinated group of people, uh, and then we can watch it percolate, and so we actually watch it spread. We watch the content get written and posted to um, these really dicey blogs. Uh, we watch it hit uh, Facebook and certain small groups. We watch the specific requests that it be coordinated and shared out. Um, we see it happening in Twitter, in secret Twitter chat groups. We see it happening on Discord, on Twitch, on 4chan, you name it. Um, so we have this kind of top line perspective that lets us uh, track content as it percolates from platform to platform. Um, whereas the platform's job is to understand what's happening kind of in its own house. And particularly back in 2016, before the problem was recognized as widely systemic, um, there were not a whole lot of people who were sitting in the tech platforms thinking, how is, the, how is Russian intelligence misusing my platform today? So what happened with Russia was, you know, we, we live in an age where societal divisions are high. And you know, you've probably heard about the two Americas. Um, social networks show us what we want to see. And so there's an idea that the two Americas actually consume very different types of content. Sam alluded to this when he was talking about information omnivores. Most often people will see content from one particular um, you know, blue content or red content, since we're talking about the US here. Um, the problem with seeing only blue content or red content is it reinforces a particular point of view, makes you think that everybody kind of thinks the way that you are. Um, since you are sort of constantly seeing that reinforced content and that reinforced perspective, your guard is down a little bit. And so, especially when it's a friend or someone that you know or trust who's doing the sharing, um, you don't think Jane is trying to manipulate me by sharing this article from some blog I've never heard of. Uh, instead, you're sort of in, you're already in an environment of, um, you know, believing good things both about the sharer and then when the share happens to reinforce your perspective, uh, you're just much more inclined to kind of readily accept it. So social networks were designed to show people what makes them feel happy and engaged. And so it's very rare in a platform that's goal is to make you happy and engaged for them to voluntarily interject. You know, me, I have a slightly left of center feed most of the time. It would be a little bit incongruous for me to suddenly start seeing Fox and Friends video clips stuck in there. So the downside is that um, the division and the disparity in what we see kind of perpetuates and even increases the idea of the kind of two siloed separate Americas. Uh, and what that does is that really opens the door for disinformation campaigns and propagandists to produce content that looks just plausible enough that we don't stop and think about it. And so the Russia pages, um, we saw two things in particular. You know, the names, some of the pages were things like Blacktivist. And that was a um, you know, largely plausible um, Black Lives Matter type page that was just a little bit extreme. Uh, and then it got progressively more and more extreme. But in the er early days when people were just starting to follow it, particularly when they were paying for ads to grow their page numbers, it was just a little tiny bit, you know, it was, it was maybe your point of view on the issue, but just a little bit out there. So just widening the Overton window just that much. Um, and we saw this with all of the pages. They all had very similar things. The ad would be relatively innocuous. Um, army of 
Jesus, I think was the name of the page that posted this one. Um, the, the early army of Jesus posts were much more just sort of like a Christian-ish Facebook page, and then all of a sudden you go in and you watch the content evolve, and you have Hillary boxing, um, boxing uh, Jesus, and then there's also a couple of like, um, you know, not today Satan sort of, you know, like like if you want Hill, like like if you want Jesus to win, I think was actually the caption that on the banner on top of this. And so, of course, if you like if you want Jesus to win, what you've done by liking it is you've communicated signal back uh, that you're receptive to this type of content. So that's what the platform sees, and they don't really know that it's a propagandist content. They just know that you've liked something on the page. So you're going to see more of it. You're informing the recommender system. And then the other thing is when you like something or take an action, uh, that action is transmitted to your friends. Uh, oftentimes, not all of the time, but some percentage of the time, what you do on the platform is communicated to people who might find it interesting. So the challenge of like, if you want um, Jesus to win, uh, is that you are kind of perpetuating the spread of the propaganda. So the Russia-linked accounts, um, they bought political ads that focused on social issues, never for a candidate, always for a social issue. This, of course, is sort of tacitly against a candidate. Well, it's, it's in fact quite clearly against a candidate, if we're being perfectly honest. Um, but what we have here is um, most of the focus, blacktivist, uh, army of Jesus, secured borders, defend the second, these are the names of some of the pages, uh, was really to continue to facilitate division. And they actually did this in the real world, too. So it's not just the ads and the uh, the ads and the pages and the content. They were actually creating events that were getting people to show up in real life. So there was a situation in Texas where they had a Texas secessionist group, I believe, was um, they had a couple of Texas groups, but they had a Texas secessionist group, and then they had a um, pro-Islam Texas page. So they weren't just targeting the right or the left. They were in fact targeting any type of divisive issue they could, and they held rallies on the same day. They invited the Texas secessionists um, to rally for secession or gun rights or something, and then they invited the um, Muslims to come and, and defend Islamic heritage to the same location, same place, same time. And so this is how these things jump out of the real world, and if you want to really get into all of the um, tactics that they got into, the, the Mueller indictment um, against the, the Russian parties is um, pretty incredible. So the other strategy was to create hundreds of fake accounts that linked back to their own websites. Uh, and this is where, again, the content that you look at on the internet does, in fact, send signal back to inform recommender systems and to inform ads and other things about what you are interested in. Um, so. We can't conclusively say that Russian disinformation campaign changed the election. We have no idea. It's really hard to gauge output. The information is so fragmented. But what we can say um, is that it, it has had a phenomenal impact um, on our conversation, uh, you know, on our society, in the sense that it's decreased trust, it's increased societal fractures. And hopefully the good that will come out of it is uh, people will be more informed as we move into 2018. Or we're in 2018, as we move into the elections. Um, and lest you think that just because the social platforms know that it's going on that that means it's fixed, that's not quite where we are yet. Um, the Roy Moore campaign in Alabama, so one of the things that researchers were looking at was the notion of perhaps how many of you heard the narrative that Roy Moore's accusers were paid? How many of you guys paid attention to the Alabama special election? Yeah. <laughs> how many of you heard that uh, Roy Moore's accusers were paid? Yeah. So um, there was an interesting Twitter account called Umpire43. And one day that Twitter account uh, started, it, it tweeted that its wife had special inside information. The bio on the Twitter account said that this was a former Navy SEAL and a you know, former signals intelligence specialist and so on and so forth. They had this um, very unimpeachable military uh, type persona was behind this, this particular uh, fake person. This was a fake person. Um, and this fellow tweeted that his wife had received information from her friend that Roy Moore's accusers were paid a thousand dollars with the dollar sign at the end, and so, <laughs> so this is a, there's certain really interesting things that we start to see with like Russian you know Russian keyboards don't have commas I'm sorry apostrophes because the possessive case doesn't use an apostrophe so there and the dollar sign at the end is another sort of notorious signal that this is not a not an American certainly not an American serviceman. Uh, would probably not make that mistake. So this is the examples of the kind of signals that we look to pick up. We, of course, then see when we go look at Umpire 43, how many times that account's stuff has made it into Red State Blog and a couple of the other sort of um, less uh, diligent about fact-checking right-wing blogs. 
And so that particular fake account's materials were amplified. You know, the posts that this particular fake account was making were amplified to people who then went and read those blogs as well. And he was posted in there, he, as an authoritative source, as opposed to um, a troll from God knows where. Um, it's also really hard to conclusively say Russia, even though this is, uh, this is where we are. So the, you know, the goal of all of this is really to create a sense. Oh, and by the way, Empire 43 was because in 2012, the account was a baseball bot. So we went way far back in time to look at what this account had been doing over the, the prior you know, six years and found that in 2012, it just tweeted baseball stats. And it was a completely automated account that had probably been bought and sold. Um, and that is how fake accounts are transacted, and that is why um, when I get into the what to do, really understanding who is behind the message is so critical. So the goal of a lot of these efforts is to create doubt and disillusionment. It's to make you feel that it is just way too hard uh, to tell what's true and what's not true. That you know, it, it in some ways actually reinforces that what you see from your friends is going to be the thing that you pay the most attention to, even if your friends aren't necessarily um, going out there and, and sharing the most fact check stuff. So two things you can do. Um, the first is really investigate the narrative. Since we are, you know, since a lot of people do feel just absolutely burdened by trying to figure out what is and isn't a real source, and since they take so much of their information from their friends, uh, it's really important to pay attention to what you're sharing. You know, are you kind of a good uh, citizen in your in your friend group? Do you fact check your sources, or do you just say, well, this this headline made me feel a certain way, and so I'm going to reshare it uh, so that other people, you know, feel that same sense of righteous outrage. Um, so actually going and taking the time to do the fact check, you know, a lot of the platforms will probably talk about their fact checking efforts. Um, but so that is where, uh, that is where we are. Anyone can get taken in by a story that confirms their biases. It's not a partisan issue at all. It's just human nature. And then the second thing is really to investigate the speaker. So there are a lot of fake accounts on social media and particularly if you hang out on pages or groups on Facebook, you know, they, they try their best to kind of keep their garden clean. But um, fake accounts do, uh, do still pop up. Uh, Twitter in particular, which doesn't, uh, which doesn't have a problem with anonymity, um, that also trying to get a sense of like who is talking, why has this been shared hundreds of thousands of times. Um, really looking to see if you're engaging with somebody uh, deeply, you know, is the narrative authentic? And if this is a person I don't know, um, you know, inviting me to an event um, in my community that sounds potentially incendiary, um, who is this? You know, just take the extra time to, to check. Um, so what we have, you know, kind of our best defense against bots and disinformation campaigns isn't a password or a firewall. Uh, it's, it's us, it's community, it's being stronger and more adaptable, uh, understanding that this is where the information ecosystem is. And there are a lot of positive things that the platforms are doing to try to fix it. There are a lot of very positive things that regulators are doing to try to ensure that that happens. Um, but right now where we are is the best thing to do is to call out false narratives within our community um, and really press for facts. And above all, we have to have the courage to unflinchingly pursue the truth, uh, even when it leads us to confront our own biases or have uncomfortable conversations. So thank you. Thank you very much, Renee. That was fantastic. What that got me thinking on was, uh, was this, this idea that information's cyclical, right? So lest you should think, I'm not on social media, and therefore this doesn't affect me, consider the fact that most journalists take their signals on what to report on, at least in some part, from trends on social media. So what appears in the New York Times and the Washington Post sometimes is influenced by misinformation or disinformation. They are not immune to it, just as Breitbart, Huffington Post, whoever else are not immune. With that, I am going to introduce our next speaker. Uh, Dan Russell is Google's Uber tech lead for search quality and user happiness in Mountain View. Dan. So I want you to think about credibility and truth and what's the relationship because this is kind of what we're talking about today. What do we know is true? How do we know it? And what do we think of as credible resources? So I want to show you my favorite credible resource, which is my mom. <laughs> and, and my mom is incredibly credible. 
about a lot of things. Raising family, raising kids, I would argue. Music, lots of things. Quantum mechanics, not so much. <laughs> what that tells me, though, is that even very credible sources have their limits. There are things you can expect them to do and to know and to not. One of the things I love about my mom, though, is when I ask her a question and she doesn't know the answer or she gives me erroneous information, she will say she's wrong later. But she'll say she's wrong. <laughs> and that's an important signal because some resources, like, say, the New York Times here, publish every day their corrections. We got it wrong yesterday. We fixed it today. We got it wrong last week. We fixed it tomorrow. That's an important signal because there are some websites you know about that never have an error. You should be very suspicious about these websites. So an important thing I want you to, to take away from this, though, is that as important as errors are, as a signal of credibility, it's important to also realize that credibility is not the same. It's not equal to truth. Credibility is a subjective measure. It's what you impute to the source. So in particular, your assessment of credibility changes and is variable by the topic, by the time, by the source, and so on. Importantly, it's very much dependent upon your point of view, hence the cartoon in the lower left. Your point of view on the subject may deeply influence your notion of what's accurate, what's truthful, and what's credible. So I have a wonderful, wonderful example. You might think, for example, that the Nobel Prize is a signal of truth and credibility. But let me introduce you to Julius Wagner Jaureg. He won the Nobel, P uh, Nobel Prize in Medicine in 1927 for his discovery of the groundbreaking therapeutic value of malaria inoculation in the treatment of syphilis. Yes, he discovered that people who have syphilis when they get malaria get better. So he proposed fixing people who have syphilis by giving them malaria. Is that a good idea? I, I don't know. The thing about it is it's true. People who have syphilis who get malaria often get better. It's a bad idea, but they do get better. So he discovered a true thing that's just not very credible today. There's a lot of Nobel Prizes. If you go back in time, you think, oh, wait a second, that was crazy. This is one. We have a lot of common beliefs in, in our parlance today that we think of. For example, I remember going to library classes back in the day and being told that .com sites are more credible than .org sites, and .net sites are more credible than .com sites, and it, .info, et cetera, et cetera, right? Now, there's a problem with this. There's a big problem with this. For example, if you go to GoDaddy, which is a place that sells domain names, and you say, League of Women Voters, you can buy leagueofwomenvoters.com for $12. <laughs> is it a credible site? Who knows? <laughs> Even worse, you can buy leagueofwomenvoters.org, leagueofwomenvoters.us, leagueofwomenvoters.net, et cetera. You see where I'm going with this? The price goes down as you go farther down the page. <laughs> for four bucks, you can buy leagueofwomenvoters.live. And you can put whatever you want on it. You see the problem? We do live in a zero time publishing cycle. I can put anything out and I can put it on sites that look credible. Beware. So I really like what, what Sarah and Renee have been saying. We have to not only be aware of these things, be aware of our media diet and be aware of the things we're taking in, but you have to be a little bit critical. So I wanna be clear, by credibility I want to say it's stuff you find believable. Truth doesn't enter into it, it's separate. Authoritative means how much does this particular site or resource have a degree of officiality around it? Think about this, you can have an authoritative site that's not credible, you probably know some of those, right? Or informative, right? You can have a site that's not credible, not authoritative, but very informative. And likewise, you can have sites that are very useful, but not credible, not authoritative, but informative and useful. You see, these are all different properties. We should not confuse them. And what about truth? That's a hard topic, <laughs> okay? Here's an example. You recognize this? 
Benjamin Franklin, right? You probably have him in your pocket. Okay, is this Benjamin Franklin the American superstar inventor or Benjamin Franklin British trader? Or is it Benjamin Franklin, purveyor of fake news? Because Benjamin Franklin wrote frankly overt fake news. He invented Indian atrocities on the settlers. He totally made this up out of whole cloth and published it. So, who's believable here? It becomes a real issue when we start living and thinking about the world that we live in now, which has a lot of technology to support the creation of interesting, difficult to parse images. So you might have seen the Dove Evolution videos, which has a picture of a young woman who, through the magic of makeup and Photoshop, becomes an image that you can put on a poster, you can put on a billboard, you can put into the pages of a magazine to sell products. Which is true in those images? Well, they're both true, right? Now, here's a little test for you. Here are a set of images. Some of these are actual pictures with a camera. Some of these are computer generated. Go ahead, look at them for a second. Pick one that you think is a real image and pick one that you think is computer generated. Okay, and I'll give you the answer. Okay, you got them? Now look, the red ones are real pictures. Anybody get it wrong? Yes, <laughs> exactly my point, okay? So I particularly like the, the, the guy down there in the bottom row, the computer-generated uh, impish-looking man. Right, I thought it was a live picture, it's not. Let me give you my very favorite illustration of this, of the problems we're facing now as technology advances. Do you see the problem here? <laughs> now, if you go in and look at the frames, you can actually tell this is all fake, right? This has been edited to make the Holy Father doing a very, you know, cheesy car uh, magic trick. <laughs> the problem is this technology is getting better. In five years, I'm not gonna be able to tell whether that's fake or real. This is happening in photos with Photoshop, it's happening with audio, it's happening with video like you see here. This is a really interesting problem for us. But let's think about the, the, the world we live in right now. Suppose you're a sixth grade student and you do a query like, I wanna find out about all the explorers. You type that in. Well, this takes you to this result which looks like a wonderful web page. It's a great site, all the explorers. But when you start reading carefully, you learn that Christopher Columbus was born in 1951 in Sydney, Australia. <laughs> So every kid in the United States will go, wait a second, wait a second. But suppose they were looking about for the explorer Jacques Cartier. They might not pick up on this little fact that he explored theoretically with Henry Hudson, Lewis and Clark and John Glenn. <laughs> or that in, 19, in 1535, he took the three ships, the Nina, the Pinta and the Santa Maria back. The third of which was completely stocked with hundreds of top quality watches. See, if you're in the sixth grade and you haven't heard about Jacques Cartier, the actual explorer, and you read this, you go, yeah, that sounds good, right? So think about what this means for us. How do we determine that this is actually a hoax? Because when you look at pictures like that, you go, yeah, I can, com I can generate that on a computer. You've seen Star Wars. You know we can make this. And it gets a little bit more complicated when you do a query like this. You read a story, say, about UFOs coming from Saturn. So you do a query, Saturn, UFO, NASA, and you get remarkable results. How do you start to discriminate fantasy from fact, credible resources from non-authoritative resources? I think Abraham Lincoln said this best when he said, the problem with quotes on the internet is that they're hard to verify. <laughs> It's true, right? So we have to realize that this kind of thing is actually deeply embedded in our culture. We all know about emoticons, we know the language of the internet and so on. So when you go to a website, a question answering website, you see a question like this. Is it true that Rosa Parks would have moved to the back of the bus but she was listening to her iPod? 
And the best answer chosen by the asker is, yeah, it's true. What went wrong here? What went wrong is that the asker did not understand what that symbol means. You are all literate people. You know that that's the universal emoticon for sarcastic reply. That's the tongue sticking out. I'm pulling your leg is what that means. And the asker's rating is great. Five stars, I'll put that in my report. I trust you, you have the nicest avatar. The quality of one's avatar, this is a big tip. The quality of one's avatar is not a basis on assessing the credibility of a result. Okay? We also live in a time when knowledge itself is changing. Now, you may not think about this because you think of things like the Aral Sea as being a constant in our universe. But in fact, the Aral Sea is now a giant freshwater pond. It's not even particularly large. Or how about Zaire? Remember Zaire? It used to be a country in Africa. It's not anymore. How about junk DNA? You see where I'm going with this? Molecular biology, geopolitics, the fundamentals of things we think we know is true are changing. Junk DNA is now recognized as real DNA content. To make this worse, as we were just hearing, your community makes a big effort, makes a big impact on your assessment of these things. So does the aesthetics of the site you look at. And this is something that's intrinsic in us and we can't not do it. So when you look at a website like this, this is RYT Hospital and Duane Medical Center, you think, yeah, I'd go there. They have cute babies. The website is wonderful. It will take your credit card. It's got a copyright notice. It's got all those usual marks of a credible site. It's only when you get to this page that you start to wonder. Male pregnancy therapies. Is this an Arnold Schwarzenegger movie or is it a real thing? Lots and lots of sixth graders in the United States have been tripped up by this website. This is part of the culture of the internet. We have spoof sites. There is no Pacific Northwest tree octopus, just so you know. <laughs> that doesn't stop thousands of sixth graders from writing learned essays every fall about this animal. Or about DHMO, which is dihydrogen monoxide, which as we all know is a real threat to us. Wait, wait, wait. Dihydrogen, 2H10, 2H10. Oh yeah, it's water, okay? The problem with this website, which was a spoof website, is it led a city in Southern California that shall remain unnamed to try to ban the importation of dihydrogen monoxide, <laughs> which really pissed off the water department. <laughs> so we live in a world where this kind of stuff is just normal. And making fake sharks in the middle of the streets of New Jersey during Superstorm Sandy is an entertainment for somebody who loves to do that. It's not hard to figure this one out as fake because when you go to the guy's Facebook page, he says, my hobby is making fakes. That's not hard, right? He admits it. So I think Hemingway actually has it right when he said every man should have a built-in crap detector. <laughs> and furthermore, this is something we need to teach. It's not intuitive in all of us how to do this. So let me give you a couple of quick tools and strategies for doing this. First big one, please, before you post that crazy thing or before you repost that insane message you got from your uh, mother-in-law, do one more search. Search for shark sharks in New Jersey during Sandy and you'll find quickly it's a hoax. One more search often will give you insight and will stop you from having egg on your face. Think about doing this kind of background analysis by looking at who the author is. It's not hard to do this, but what makes this author an expert? Are they just a bot that's repeating some nonsense it picked up? Or in the case of the UFOs from Saturn, do they show their badge in the lower left corner to give it a clue about what their inclination is? <laughs> they really want to find aliens. They put a badge of an alien in their website. Check the website itself for background information. It's not hard to see who the authors are and see what other articles they've written. Check the about page. Check the web address. For example, if you do, if you heard a story that, for example, that the World Trade Organization, WTO, is instituting a formalized slavery market in Africa, your spidey sense should go, what? <laughs> and you should say, wait a second, I'm going to do a search and you'll find this website looks like that. It says, oh my gosh, 
They really are setting up a slavery site. Is that true? Well, if you check the title of the page, it says WTO, World Trade Organization, GATT, Global Agreement on Trade and Tariffs. Wow, that must be right. But look at the URL there, www.gat.org. Go check that one out and you discover that's the website of a group called the Yes Men. The Yes Men on their homepage say, we do international hoaxes. Again, not hard to figure this out. So before you get outraged, check, right? Before you get really upset and pissed off about something, do the obvious search first. You want to do these sort of obvious quality checks, and there's a lot of resources online that help you figure out, for example, using double quotes to find the author's name and all these tricks you can do. You want to check the data quality. For example, consider what would prove this outrageous thing I'm reading to be wrong? How would you answer that question? For example, you can ask a terrible question like, is the average length of an octopus 18 inches? That's leading the jury. Don't ask questions like that. There are bad questions, and that's one. Avoid confirmation bias. So a better query would be just ask, what's the average length of an octopus? So when you're doing these kinds of researches, you want to look for bibliographies, citations, that, all that kind of stuff. Check the news sites to see what's background. But also, use common sense. I know, that's asking a lot. <laughs> but look, if somebody tells you that's a picture of the United States from a satellite during the Great Northeast blackout of 2003, <laughs> you would say, yeah, New York is gone. There really was a power blackout then. But wait a second. You should be very suspicious of that picture because why? No clouds. There are no clouds in North America. Give me a break. <laughs> right? Never happens. So look at these things skeptically. Do the obvious searches. And there are a lot of search tools. Let me just show you one, and then we'll summarize here. If someone tells you this is the result of a terrible winter, a Lake Michigan, shores right by Chicago, water's coming up and coating these cars with ice, terrible winter. But if you go to Google search and right click on that image, you can search for that image. Did you know that? You can search for images, right? Incredibly handy tool. And you will find that this picture is not from Chicago, but in fact is from 2005 from Lake Geneva. I'm giving you a funny example here, but you can see lots of examples where people post pictures of riots or missile attacks in the Middle East and claim it's from last week in Lebanon or wherever, Syria or something. But if you actually do the Google search, you'll find out it's actually from 10 years ago from another country. Recap, please do one more search. Check these things. Check the expertise of the author and their motivations. Try to understand by looking at their website for the background, who owns the site, what are they doing, what's their motivation. Try to validate the data you see in stories and be skeptical, think critically and use all these search tools we've caught. So a quick uh, uh, promo here. I have an online course called Power Searching with Google.com. It's 20 hours of exactly how to do this kind of thing. I have a blog where I post stuff every week, and that's the way you find it. I want to leave you with this last thought. Benjamin Franklin, Julius Wagner Jaureg, Abraham Lincoln, and my mom all agree, before you post or repost <laughs> that message of dubious value and questionable parentage, Please do one more search. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dan. That was amazing. Um, I did not know Rosa Parks had an iPod. Uh, one of the things this made me think of while I was, while I was listening was when I watch regular TV, which wasn't, isn't very often now because of Netflix, sometimes I watch the Discovery Channel. And oftentimes when I'm watching the Discovery Channel, there's something about visitors from another planet. And as a researcher, I'm always really interested to see uh, what their academic affiliation is. <laughs> and so uh, sometimes they say, they'll have this guy, he's a talking head, he's wearing a jacket like me and nerd glasses too, you know? And, he's, and it, it says ancient alien, or ancient, ancient astronaut researcher. And I'm like, what? is this, but it's presented as if it were true. So the idea is that this exists in our world 
even on TV, on radio, and everything. And this is presented as credible. But the thing that we got to think about here and today is that the massive amount of data alongside tools like AI or machine learning means that the way that information gets transmitted in today's world is a little different than it used to be. So we've got to ask a few more questions. With that, I will introduce our next speaker. Tessa Lyons is product manager at Facebook. She's in charge of something very important. She is focusing on the integrity of information on the news feed. Thank you so much. Um, and I have to say, Dan, that is the funniest presentation on false news I have ever seen in my life. Um, so I don't know how anyone can follow it. <laughs> Uh, I wanted to thank Lisa and the League of Women Voters and all of the speakers for bringing together um, such a great group for such an important topic. I agree. <laughs> uh, so what I wanted to share today uh, was really three things. First, I want to talk a little bit about why you see what you see on Facebook and how you can control it. Secondly, I want to talk about the efforts that we are investing in in order to better protect the integrity of our platform, which is particularly important around elections. And third, since it tends to get a lot of coverage, even in the conversations we've seen today, I want to talk briefly about the work that we're doing with third-party fact checkers. Now, I want to start by saying that we as Facebook know that we have a role to play in election integrity. And we also know that things happened on our platform in 2016 that should never have happened. We take these abuses really seriously because they violate everything that we stand for and the mission that we have for empowering people in order to bring the world closer together. I want to touch before I dive in on just some of the things that we've been doing around election integrity and then I'll circle back to these as we go on today. So four of the areas that we've been really focused on. One is investing in people. We've grown in the last year, the security team that we have at Facebook, from 10,000 to what will be by the end of the year, 20,000 people. Because we know that there are things that we need to do better on and that there are many tasks that require people, not just technology. At the same time, we know that with a community of two billion people around the world, Relying on human review alone is not enough. So we've also made investments in technology, in machine learning, in artificial intelligence, in many cases to help us get better and faster at detecting potential abuses and prioritizing them for human review. The third area that we've really invested in is taking a more proactive stance and looking for harmful content. People like Renee have been doing great work in this area for a long time, and as she mentioned, the platforms found ourselves behind what a lot of other researchers were doing in the last few years. And so we've really invested in not just catching up, but also ensuring that we're looking ahead to future abuses to make sure that we are prepared and upholding our responsibility to the people who use our platform. And the fourth is working with our community. You know, Renee talked about how this is really a system-wide problem, and we know that we're not going to solve it unless we're working together. One of the things that I'm really grateful for as a product manager on this area at Facebook is how closely I've been able to collaborate with other tech platforms, with academics, with researchers, with civil society, and with organizations like the League of Women Voters. Now, I mentioned that I would start with the topic of why do I see what I see in my news feed and what can I do to control it? So I want to ask, and I promise that I won't be offended, how many of you use Facebook by a show of hands? Okay, now keep your hands up if you think that you know how Facebook works. Cool. So I see that as both an opportunity and a sign of feedback that we need to do a better job of explaining it. Now, I work specifically on Newsfeed. And for those of you who use Facebook, you probably don't even really think of Newsfeed as a product because it's really the place that you start when you open your Facebook app on your phone or on your computer. And it's where you see a lot of the stories from people that you've connected with, from your family, from friends, from pages that you follow, from events that you've RSVP'd to. Now, Newsfeed has a set of values. And these are the values that my team and I work to uphold every day. First and foremost, Newsfeed is about friends and family. 
And that's something that, frankly, I think we've gotten away from a little bit in the last few years and that we're really committed to coming back to now. Secondly, Facebook is a platform for all ideas. With two billion people around the world, we're really proud of the fact that Facebook can give people voice who've never had it in the same way online. And we also know that that brings challenges, which is why another important value is that we believe in authentic communication. The types of inauthentic dialogue and discourse that we've seen in the past and that were highlighted today aren't at all what Facebook stands for. And they're some of the areas that we've been investing to prove our efforts on. Third, fourth, we really believe in controls. And one of the things I think we have an opportunity to do better is not just help people understand why they're seeing what they're seeing on Facebook, but how they can control it, which is one of the things I want to touch on today. And then fifth, we are constantly iterating. We believe that we always have a lot more work to do in order to uphold these values and our responsibility. And we're constantly making improvements to ensure that we do so. So how does Newsfeed work? And I apologize, we converted from Keynote to PowerPoint, so you're going to see a, a few floating letters throughout the presentation. <laughs> I normally talk about how Newsfeed works over about 30 minutes, and I'm planning on doing it in about one, so bear with me. When you think about how Newsfeed works, it's helpful to think about it for what it is, which is a ranking algorithm. And an algorithm is really just a fancy way of saying a simple series of steps for solving a problem. And the problem that the Newsfeed ranking algorithm is solving is, what order should I show your stories in Newsfeed? You're a lot more likely to see a story that's in the first spot on your Newsfeed than the one that's in the 3,000th spot. So the Newsfeed ranking algorithm works by starting with inventory. Inventory is the collection of stories from the people that you friend and the pages that you follow. The most important thing about your newsfeed is who you choose to engage with and the pages that you choose to connect with. That's the first and most fundamental control that you have. Now, since people connect with a lot more friends and a lot more pages and they have time to really consume all the stories from in any given day, the newsfeed ranking algorithm prioritizes them by making a decision about what each individual would find most meaningful. And it does that by taking into account hundreds of thousands of different signals, things like who's the person who shared this. My mother lives abroad, and one of the th top things that I always see in my newsfeed is content from her, because her stories are really relevant to me, and I'm always commenting on them, and we'll have backs and forths, and our family will engage. So that's a really strong signal that that content is meaningful to me personally. My friend Lauren is also connected to my mom, but Lauren's a lot less likely to see my mom's content at the top of her newsfeed. Now, the third step and where this really comes into play is in predictions. With hundreds of thousands of signals, we roll into a few dozen different predictions. And those predictions are about personal relevance and meaning. And they'll predict how likely an individual story is to be meaningful to that person, which is why the prediction might be stronger for me than for Lauren. And those predictions inform a relevance score. Now, we do this whole process for every story in your inventory, every time you open Facebook, for all 2 billion people around the world. And this, in a nutshell, is how Newsfeed ranking works. Now, one of the things I mentioned that's a core value of Newsfeed is control. So one of the things that we've really invested in, particularly in the last few years, is making controls more front and center. One of the ways that we do this is we have a view called Newsfeed Preferences, and it's discoverable in your settings. And it helps you understand how you can follow, unfollow, how you can select people to see first. I'm on the board of a nonprofit, and it's really important to me that I always see all of the posts from that nonprofit, so I've selected to see them first. And it also gives you ways to snooze people. You know, one of the common things around this season is everyone's getting engaged. There's a lot of engagement photos. If you don't want to see all of your friends' engagement photo, maybe you snooze them for a month or so. Now, one of the other areas where it's really important to have both awareness, transparency, and control is ads. And this has been mentioned a little bit in the context of the elections, and so I wanted to touch on it briefly. Now, first and fundamentally, in order to tell if a post is an ad, you can look by seeing the sponsored text under the page link in the top left. If it says sponsored, 
That means that someone spent money in order to increase its distribution. What we've done recently is really invest in greater ads transparency. One of the things that we've done here is we're testing, oh, here it is, a view ads surface. What we're enabling, and we've started in Canada, and we're going to actually expand to the US and to other countries, is for people to be able to go on and look at a page and see all of the ads that that page has promoted. Now, the reason that's important is because pages can target their ads. They might want to send me a different message than they send my boyfriend. But it's important for the sake of transparency, particularly around elections, that all of the advertisements and all of the messages that they're sharing are transparent and discoverable. And that's why we've invested in this view ad service. We also announced, and I don't even think it's in this deck because we actually, I think, just announced this on Friday, that we're taking additional steps around ads transparency. One of the things that we're doing is we're acquiring all political ads and issue ads to have their pages verified for identity and location. And we're actually not just doing this for advertisers, we're also doing it for any large pages because, as Renee mentioned, large pages were one of the things that we saw spreading disinformation in the 2016 election and an area that we know we need to better protect. When we ever do have political or issue ads, we're gonna require that the advertisers state at the top of the ad who's behind the funding. Thank you. I think that these are really, really important steps and I'm really glad that we're investing in these areas. We know that on some of these issues, we haven't done everything that we could in the past, and so we want to come forward and do even more than TV or others are doing now to really set a new industry standard in transparency. Now, it's not just about transparency, it's also about control. And so one of the products that we have is something called Ads Preferences. And Ads Preferences, kind of like newsfeed controls, enables you to look into an ad and see, why am I seeing this? Are they targeting this to me because I liked one page or because I'm in some demographic? and to adjust your controls accordingly. Now, the second thing I wanted to talk about is what we're doing about integrity. And when we say integrity, we really mean the abuse of our platform by any bad actors to spread bad content through any types of bad behaviors. And we approach integrity in really three ways. The first thing that we do is we remove anything that violates our community standards. The second thing we do is we reduce the spread of problematic content, and that's the bucket in which we put false news. And the third thing we do is we aim to give people more information so that they can make more informed decisions about what to read, trust, and share with their communities. So I mentioned that we remove content and actors that violate our policies. Our community standards are publicly available, and they're really focused on protecting the safety and security. Oops, this is the joy of conversion the safety and security of our community. We also know that the things that violate our community standards are often correlated to the types of myths and disinformation that we've talked about today. So one example, fake accounts. On Facebook, we believe in real identity. But we also know that there are bad actors who create fake accounts in order to seed or spread misleading content. We've been investing in better technology and systems that run many, many, many times a day in order to more proactively identify and remove these fake accounts. And one thing that we shared recently in the lead up to the French election uh, last May was that we'd removed 30,000 fake accounts in France in advance of their election. Now, the second area is reducing the spread of problematic content. And when we say problematic content, what we're talking about is content that vi violates the values that we hold and the feedback from our community about the things that they care about, but that might not violate our community standards. So one example that we put in this category is false news. And now sometimes people will ask, well, why not just have a community standard that you can't say anything false on Facebook? Imagine if you were posting to your friends that you were coming to the League of Women Voters event tonight. Would we have fact-checked that and called all two billion people on our platform to make sure that you were actually driving and on your way to the event? We're a platform and we believe in giving people that voice and that ability to communicate. But we also don't want the systems of our platform to be misused, to cause misleading content to be as easily or even more easily spread as authentic content. 
And so there are steps that we can take to reduce the spread of content that's false or, or misleading. So one of the things that we do is we use machine learning to identify and predict at scale some of the tactics that are correlated to this type of misleading content. So one example is clickbait. I'm sure you've seen clickbait. Clickbait's very much correlated to misinformation, to sensationalist content. We've been building machine learning algorithms to help us predict headlines that use the tactic of clickbait. And we do this by having a data set that we're able to train on, by building a machine learning classifier, and then employing that classifier when it sees new headlines it hasn't seen before to make a prediction about how likely that new headline is to contain the tactic of clickbait. If that prediction is really strong, it gets factored into newsfeed ranking. And I talked about the signals and predictions that we make. And it causes that piece of content to have a lower relevance score and therefore to appear lower in newsfeed. Now the reason this is so important is because a lot of the false news that we see on our platform is actually financially motivated. And for the financially motivated actors, their goal is to get a lot of clicks so that they can convert people to go to their websites, which are often covered in low quality ads, and they can monetize and make money from those people's views. And if we can reduce the spread of those links, we reduce the number of people who click through, and we reduce the economic incentives that they have to create that content in the first place. Now, the third area is inform. We know that one of the most important things that we can do is inform our community to have the context that they need to make decisions about what to read, trust, and share. And I think that Dan hit home on these points so effectively. This is an area that we've really been investing in and that we're going to continue to invest in. And one of the products that we actually announced just last week that we're scaling to 100% of people in the US and then looking to explore scaling internationally is a product call, uh, that appears on every link and that gives people more context about the publisher, about other articles that the publisher has shared, about other articles from other publishers on the same topic, about where it's being shared and who's commenting on it. And this is a surface I'm excited about because I think there's a lot more that we can do to show people information and context about what they're reading. One of the things to remember is that sometimes the lack of context is actually in and of itself a good signal. If a publisher doesn't have a Wikipedia page, if there's nothing known about their standards or principles, that in and of itself can be really telling. Now, I promised that I would touch on third-party fact-checking. Third-party fact-checking is one piece of our overall approach to fighting integrity, but it is definitely an important one, and it's also one that gets a lot of attention. So I think it's helpful to, to touch on it. Now, here's how third-party fact-checking works on Facebook. We identify potential hoaxes or misinformation using a variety of different signals. One of those signals is false news feedback from our community, which I'll touch on in a second and show you a screenshot of so that you can give feedback if you encounter something that you think is false. And once we predict those things, we send them to independent third-party fact-checkers. We partner with fact-checkers now in seven countries, including the US, and we're scaling to more countries. And the fact-checkers are able to review the content and rate its accuracy. And once they mark an individual piece of content as false, we take that signal and apply it to the newsfeed ranking algorithm in order to reduce the relevance score and show that piece of content lower in newsfeed, reducing the number of people who see it. And we also put more context around it, which I'll show you in a minute. So let's go through these things in a little bit more detail. Every piece of content has a feedback option. If you click on the right top icon in every post, you'll be able to see it. And one of the options is false news. It's funny, some people ask us why we say false and not fake, and actually a few of the speakers have commented already today on how fake news has taken on kind of a meaning of its own. Um, and really what we're trying to talk about in this context is information that's factually inaccurate, so we're using the word false here. Now when you provide feedback that something is false, it's one of the signals that we use in order to determine what to prioritize to our fact checkers. When the fact checkers do rate something as false, I mentioned that we use that signal in ranking in order to have that story appear lower in newsfeed, but that we also provide more information. And this is what the more information looks like. This is an example of our related articles product. 
And so what happens is the underlying hoax, the, the false story that, that was reviewed, you can actually see here it, it's compressed. It looks smaller than a story would normally look in newsfeed. And below it, we've linked to related articles from the independent third party fact checkers with whom we partner, and we've badged them as fact checkers. Now, one of the things that Sarah mentioned is that in the research that's been done globally about how to best fight false news with more information, pointing to the truth and to more perspectives can be one of the most effective strategies. And so we've actually been evolving this treatment and product over the course of the last year while we've been testing it. And we found that related articles by actually showing people alternate views from trusted third party fact checkers um, can be really effective. Now, we don't just show people in newsfeed when they see it. We also notify anyone who previously shared the story that we've since determined from third party fact checkers was false. And if you were to go and try to share that story after we've gotten the rating from a third party fact checker, we actually pop up a warning interstitial. And all it does is it says, hey, there's actually additional reporting on this topic from this independent third party fact checker that you might want to check out before you share it. As Dan said, one of the most effective things can be just doing that one more search. And so we want to see how can we actually help people to make that easier. Now, third party fact checking is a piece of the overall efforts. But we know that with 2 billion people and all the content that we have on Facebook, we can't fact check every individual piece of content. And so we're working with our third party fact checkers to get better at predicting the false content so that the time that they do spend reviewing is on the most important cases. And also at taking action against pages and domains that repeatedly have content marked false. Few people are sort of first time offenders and if they are, it's more likely that they made a reporting mistake and they're gonna correct it. So going after the instances of actors who repeatedly share this kind of content and reducing their distribution, removing their ability to monetize, removing their ability to advertise is part of our strategy. But we also know that our community wants to be empowered with more tips and strategies for identifying this stuff in the first place. And so over the course of the year, we've been sharing an educational tool at the top of Newsfeed and also partnering with media publications in order to share these tips more broadly to provide people with 10 tips that we developed in partnership with news literacy organizations for spotting false news. You can see some of them here, and I believe they're actually also in your handouts. Now, we've talked a lot about what you can do to protect against some of the integrity challenges, to be more informed and literate consumers of social media and of digital information in general. And I also wanted to touch on some of the ways that you can use social media to connect and to be civically engaged. One of the things that you can do is find and follow your representatives. A lot of people don't know their local representatives or the people who are running for office in their local communities. And we believe on Facebook that we have an opportunity to help connect them. We have a product called Town Hall, you can just search for it in Facebook, that will help you connect with the representatives in your areas. The second thing that you can do is connect or follow pages and RSVP to events to get civically engaged. There was an event, for example, on Facebook for tonight's gathering. And the third thing that we believe we can do at Facebook to help people be civically engaged is send reminders about voter registration and election days. We've actually done this now in 47 countries around the world and we're continuing to do so. Because like the League of Women Voters, we know that voting rights and voter turnout are critical pieces of our democracy. So with that, I just wanted to say thank you again for organizing the great event and we'll look forward to taking any questions after. Thank you very much, Tessa. That's really, really good to know. It's good to know what's going on on Facebook and actually to have some information from the source about like, what's being done to combat uh, this problem, which we, we think has grown out of proportion with what it should have been. Um, we have one more speaker, last but certainly not least. Uh, Sarah McGrew is a researcher with Stanford History Education Group and uh, is based in the Graduate School of Informa uh, Education at Stanford. Sarah. Uh, 
Thanks so much for being here and for sticking around. I know it's getting a little bit late. Uh, my name is Sarah McGrew, and like Sam said, I work with the Stanford History Education Group. And because I work in a graduate school of education and I work with a group um, and we, who all have backgrounds as educators, we take a little bit of a different approach to these questions that we've been talking about tonight, right? And we're focused specifically on thinking about how to teach young people to learn more sophisticated approaches to evaluating information online. But I think a lot of the things that we've learned over the last few years are applicable for all of us, right? That we can all get better at figuring out uh, what's true and what's not when we look um, for information online. So I'm gonna talk about a few things tonight uh, based on research that we've done over the last three years. Um, and the, those are sort of two major efforts. First, we've worked on developing what are now dozens of short assessments of young people's ability to evaluate online information. And then we've also engaged in research about what more skilled people do. So we've specifically looked at professional fact checkers and tried to understand the, the really specific strategies that they use to efficiently find and, and verify information online. So I'm gonna walk you through um, sort of what we've learned from both of those efforts together. Um, and just to give some background um, for what I'm talking about, um, I wanna outline sort of three core questions that we've identified that we think people should ask when they evaluate information online. And I think we, we talk a lot about, right, like just think more critically or think more carefully. But when we think about actually trying to teach students, that kind of advice isn't actually very helpful, right? Just like think harder doesn't work very well with students. So we try to really get specific and break that down. Uh, so the first question we always wanna ask when we evaluate online Online information is who's behind the information, right? What person or organization is presenting this? Do I trust that person to present information on this particular topic? Um, and we, are they an authoritative source? And then we can dive into the topic, right? We can evaluate the evidence that's actually being presented. Again, investigating the source of evidence and then deciding ultimately whether that evidence directly and sufficiently supports the claims that are being made. And then finally, we should ask what do other sources say, right? Seeking to verify claims or arguments across multiple sources, ideally multiple sources that come from different perspectives. So I think these questions sort of cover a lot of the ground that different speakers have talked about tonight, but hopefully can start to sort of bring everything together under one umbrella and thinking about what a sort of integrated approach to evaluating online information could look like. Um, and, but I wanna show you a really practical example about what asking and answering these questions looks like online. And I wanna, I'm gonna do that with a task that we've given high school and college students. Um, piloted this task with hundreds now of students. Um, and in this task, which we do online, so students actually are, are on the live Twitter feed, uh, we show students this tweet from moveon.org from a few years ago. And it says, new polling shows the NRA is out of touch with gun owners and their own members. Gives a link and then says, hashtag NRA fail. And then there's this sort of post below it that says two out of three gun owners say they would be more likely to vote for a candidate who supported background checks. And we ask students, why might this tweet be a useful source about NRA members' opinions on background checks, and why might it not be a useful source? So this is a complicated post, right? And we ideally want students to, con to consider both the source and evidence presented, and then to sort of weigh what's, what's strong about this source and then what's less strong. Uh, and see what they come up with. So what kinds of responses do we get from students? So to the question about why it might be a useful source, the sort of most common responses we get are first students who engage marginally with the source, like the student who says move on has a large following on Twitter, uh, or students that just engage with sort of the content or appearance of the tweet. Like this student who says it could be useful because a graphic with a strong message can be enlightening or more likely thought provoking. So these students are sort of like dancing around evaluating the content or the source, but not deeply digging into evaluating who's presenting the information or what they're presenting. And then in terms of why it might not be a useful source, the most common response we get by far is about the platform itself. So students write things like, Twitter is a social platform built for sharing opinions, and though there are plenty of news organizations sharing facts on Twitter, I'd be more likely to trust an article than a tweet. So students are writing off Twitter as an entire platform, which I would argue is not very useful, right? We, want, we don't want students to write off platforms, we want them to be, up, be able to actually evaluate the information that's presented on them. So what would a more sophisticated approach to evaluating that tweet from Move On look like? And I wanna walk through that using those three core questions that I presented. 
So starting with the question of who is behind information, we want students to prioritize, again, investigating the source of information. But too often we see students passing over that entirely, right? Not asking questions about the source and just digging in to evaluating the content. And I think we all do that, especially if it's content about a topic that we feel really strongly about. It's easy to just kind of pass over the source and engage with the content. But we want students to be able to investigate the source. And we want to teach them to do that in sort of one particular way. And this is through a strategy that we identified, again, in our research with fact checkers. And we call it lateral reading. So if we were going to, again, evaluate the source of this tweet, it's moveon.org. But imagine that you're a student and you don't know what moveon.org is. You don't have the sort of things that are coming to a lot of your minds probably when you think about moveon.org. So we would encourage students to investigate the source by reading laterally, by leaving this, the tweet itself or leaving a website that you're on and actually checking what other sources have to say about it. So in this case, I simply typed moveon.org into a Google search um, to again, check what other sources say. And this makes intuitive sense if you think about it, right? If you were trying to decide if a person was trustworthy, you wouldn't walk up to them and just say, hey, are you trustworthy, right? Because of course they're gonna tell you they are. And that's the same thing we're doing when, we're, when we evaluate websites by staying on the website, right? And trusting what that website says about itself, right? So a better strategy, one that we saw fact checkers doing was to leave the site and again, see what other sources had to say. And in this case, a site like Wikipedia, can tell us pretty quickly, right? Move On is an American progressive public policy advocacy group and political action committee. It's in the first paragraph of the Wikipedia page. And your sort of warning lights about Wikipedia might be going off, but again, this is a site that we saw fact checkers rely on as a sort of initial take about an organization's reliability. So once we have a sense of what moveon.org is, again, that doesn't necessarily mean that we write the, the tweet off or decide that we, we totally trust it, but we're building our, our sort of stores of information about what MoveOn is and whether this treat, tweet is trustworthy. But next we want to investigate what's the evidence. So again, too often we see students evaluating evidence based on the appearance of evidence. So they might see this uh, graphic below, right? This says two out of three gun owners say they would be more likely to vote for a candidate. And they, they say two out of three, that's data. It must be reliable, right? Uh, but we want to teach students to, to dig more into investigating what, what that evidence actually is and who's presenting it. And in this case, luckily this link, this tweet, excuse me, provides a link, right, that we could click on. If we did that, it takes us to this article from the Center for American Progress, uh, which says in its headline, gun owners overwhelmingly support background checks, CNRA is out of touch, new poll finds. So just from that headline alone, we can start to see some alignment between the article and the tweet. Right, the, the tweet's not reporting a fact that to is totally disconnected from the article that it links to. So that's a good first check. And if we wanted to spend a little bit more time, we could dig into, again, investigating what the Center for American Progress is and investigating the, this public policy polling group that actually did the survey that both this article and the tweet are reporting on. Um, so by doing that, right, but at least we know that it's based on an actual survey that was done by a public policy polling organization and that it found that gun owners overwhelmingly support background checks. So we have that sort of like level of verification. And the final thing we want to do is ask what do other sources say, to actually go outside the tweet again and this time search for the content and see if we can verify that in other places. So if I just do a simple Google search for whether gun owners support background checks, um, I get a list of sources. The thing we see students doing, and a lot of research confirms this, is sort of blindly clicking on the first search result. And Dan talked about this, right? But that can get really problematic, particularly if students assume, as many do, that that top search result is the most reliable because it's often not, right? Uh, and it, I would argue that, and we saw fact checkers doing this, that if you spend just a few more seconds on search results and spend a little bit more time reading down the page, you can make a more informed decision about where to click first. And we can do that in a couple of ways. So the first is reading URLs, right? There's a lot to learn about actually reading that green text, seeing what source is providing the information. In this case, the first result is from Huffington Post. And if we have some source knowledge, we can start to make some inferences about what the Huffington Post might have to say about gun control and background checks. 
And we can also read the snippets, right, which provide some information about what the source is going to say. So we can start to determine, again, if we, if we did click into that website, is it likely to provide information that's relevant to my search? So in this case, again, if my goal is to sort of verify the information that was in that moveon.org tweet, I can read down the URLs and the snippets and start to see Huffington Post, uh, Gifford's Law Center, which is again sort of a gun control uh, legal organization, the Center for American Progress, and then I get to the Washington Post and Pew. And again, if my goal, I already have a source from a liberal advocacy group from Move On. So if my goal is to find sort of a more central or authoritative source, I might click on the Washington Post or Pew Research Center, both of which I recognize uh, to be the sort of more authoritative organizations. So in this case, just reading down a few more of the search results, engaging a little bit of time reading uh, might result in a better click for where to actually go for information to verify. Um, so again, I realize that we're not going to engage in this, in this kind of verification that I just walked through, asking who's behind, what's the evidence, and what do other sources say, and investigating time, uh, investing time in investigating all those things with every tweet we see or every Facebook post we see, right? We would all go crazy. Uh, but I would argue that sort of developing those questions as habits of mind, and particularly asking ourselves those questions, who's behind this information? What's the evidence? What do other sources say? Can I confirm the story in other places? That asking those questions before we share a story or before we use something to influence our views or to, to guide an action that we might take, uh, the more informed we can be and the more informed our communities can be. And with that, I will stop. Um, I will say those, those assessments that I talked about are on our website, shag.sanford.edu, if you have children or want to try them out for yourselves. Um, they're a lot of fun, and they're organized by those three core questions that I introduced today. So thank you, and I look forward to the conversation. Thank you very much, Sarah. I think we're going to do some questions. So I have some questions that people have passed up to the front. Uh, my plan here is to try to get a question to each of our speakers. So uh, the first one I'm going to start off with is for Renee. Renee, what do you say when people say Snopes or other fact-checking sites are partisan? Is this on? Yeah. Um, it is. I mean, I think it's ridiculous. Am I allowed to say that? <laughs> <laughs> I just do. I think it's ridiculous. I think it's a cop out, candidly. Um, I think that there are, you know, fake news was never about what you agree with or don't agree with. It was, it was, it was supposed to be about um, the original use of the term was really to refer to information that was inauthentic. And so you can read a Snopes fact check and decide that you still don't like Hillary Clinton, but acknowledge that Pizzagate is probably not the reason to justify your dislike of Hillary Clinton. Um, and so that is, uh, so, so in my opinion, I think that that's just a real cop out. And I think the people who say that are, are people who are uh, locked into a, to a partisan mindset and just, um, you know, if you don't, if you don't want to read it on Snopes, go read it on PolitiFact. Sure. Sure, and if you were to say that about Snopes, I would say to you that uh, their chief of marketing is, is a former army member, and that they're, they have various people from various political parties that work for them. So they are kind of unimpeachable in some ways. Um, okay, next question. So uh, for Tessa, considering their social responsibilities what should social media companies policy be on maintaining freedom of speech while also filtering misinformation yeah. so look it's a it's an important and challenging question um, one thing i will say is there's a lot of steps that we can take that sure. don't even need to get close to broaching that question uh, removing inauthentic accounts removing pages who are trying to uh, mislead people by not authentically representing who they are, where they're located. To me, those don't violate freedom of speech. Those are about transparency, accountability, and authenticity. I think the point at which we'd be violating freedom of speech is saying that you, Sam, can't share your opinion about politics sure. on Facebook, but that's not at all what any of the things that I've talked about or any of the steps that we're taking. In some ways, you know, like Renee, I think it can become a cop-out. Um, and I think that we have a responsibility to both protect freedom of speech and to ensure integrity. Great. Uh, Sarah McGrew, um, how can we make sure our children, who are such avid consumers of the internet and its content, have critical thinking skills available to evaluate? 
things like misinformation. And as a little addition to that, to what extent is this a part of um, curriculum, as you know it, in public schools? Sure. So, I mean, I think the sort of first step in the work that we've been trying to do for the last few years is to bust myths that I think still exist out there that young people are, for some reason, smarter and better at evaluating information than the rest of us, right? That because they've grown up with digital devices and because they can, you know, like text and tweet really quickly, that somehow that means that they're, they're more able to evaluate the information that they're finding. Um, and that's just not, it's patently untrue. And we've known it's untrue for a long time, but it's, it's still really easy, I think, to engage with those myths. So I think that's the first thing, is being really clear that young people need our help um, and need our support. And I think the, the question of curriculum is a huge one and the one that we are spending more and more time thinking about. And the answer is that it hasn't, digital literacy or teaching students to engage with online information hasn't been integrated into the core of the curriculum. Uh, for a long time. So I think often it's taught in extracurricular classes like like fabulous journalism classes, right? Or the school librarian might come in to teach a, a research class. Um, but particularly in more under-resourced schools, those classes don't exist or a librarian doesn't even exist. Um, so I would argue that we need to bring these skills into the core of every subject area. I particularly work in history and social studies education. Uh, but think about what it looks like to teach history and social studies and engage students with the internet, engage students in doing research on the open internet right, not just telling them specific websites that they can and can't go to, and then giving them specific strategies. So another problem with um, digital literacy education has been that they use these sort of long checklists of, of answers, sometimes up to 30 questions that we tell kids to ask about websites. <laughs> and some of them are super problematic questions, like we tell kids that .edu sites are more reliable across the board than .com sites, which as Dan told us is just patently, again, untrue. Um, so we need to update our methods and we need to bring digital literacy again into the sort of core of the curriculum. Great, thank you, Sarah. And uh, moving to Sarah O. Oh. Um, one of the things you talked about was uh, uh, having, having an alternative way of engaging with information. Um, if, if contradicting false news doesn't work and giving alternative information does, uh, what does that mean to you? Like, so what are examples of that? Yeah, a great example that um, many people teach now is looking at some of the interventions that were designed around uh, the Kenyan elections that were very violent a few years ago. Uh, lots of division in society, groups with opposing views, and a lot of people out there whipping up hate speech, rumors, false information. Uh, the groups that designed the interventions then were looking at texts. Everyone had uh, feature phones. Um, the most scary things that were reported were people in mass sending false information to voters on election day. And um, based on some of the tests that the civil society and civic education groups on the ground ran, they found that by saying don't listen to fake information, don't uh, listen to the rumors you receive, was far less effective than a message like Let's show our support um, for each other and uh, protect our community on election day. Or let's um, show how wise we are as a community and question the information we receive on election day. Um, they were really appealing to aspirational outcomes uh, that were built around security and community building and education. So you can see already um, how different those two types of messages are. And so that's a great example if you want to look into some civic outreach and civic engagement messages, um, how those really helped push back on some of the spam and information hijacking that happened around an election. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, Dan, a question that's come up uh, from a few people is that it seems as if independent voices in some ways have been scrubbed out of the internet, and in some ways the internet, internet has diluted information. Um, so the question here is how do we deal with information dilution? And how do we, uh, how do we have access to independent voices when uh, there's such a wide array of information well, online? I would question the premise. I mean, <laughs> independent voices? Come on. <laughs> there are a billion independent voices. So sure. I think, especially in a world where um, it costs nothing to start up a new website, it costs nothing to create a new you know, uh, a group on Facebook, it costs nothing to st start up a new Twitter account, 
we have a lot of voices. Now, I, I sort of agree with the dilution problem mm -hmm. because it can be difficult to find you know, reliable information on a particular topic because there's so much, and especially in a world where there's so many uh, participants trying to publish on a particular topic, it can be difficult to find the one you want in there. And that's, and that's kind of a research, it's a basic search skill. Mm. But, so I don't think the problem is a lack of independent voices. I think the problem is a, a, a surfeit of independent voices that could be drowning out the thing you want to find. Interesting point, I, I like that. Um, why don't we take, Lisa, should we take a, cup, a couple minutes for you to do your last yes, few comments? Great. So bear with me just for a few minutes. Actually, I'm going to be asking Sam and Dan to talk again for a second. Um, so Sam has offered, if we're interested, to do kind of a follow-up session. And I, Sam, would you say a, a couple words about what you're thinking about? And I'm just going to ask for a show of hands because we want to see, is it worth going further on it? And I'll do the same thing with Dan, and then we'll move to some of the, the final closing things. Sure. So for me, um, usually I'm not a moderator. I am a social scientist. so. Uh, one of the things that I've done is to, um, I've been asked by the State Department to travel and give talks on the rise of what I call computational propaganda, specifically related to my research and what it shows in global circumstances. So usually what I do is I talk about several different countries and the way that disinformation, misinformation, and propaganda play a role and what people are doing to fight back. And so uh, I'd be happy to give that talk at some point. So just asking for a show of hands, would there be interest in that? Super, that's very helpful. <laughs> awesome, awesome. And the other yeah. one, I had such a great conversation when we first kicked this off with Dan Russell. Um, you may not know, but he's also married to a very, very active league member, and so he's volunteered for us before, and he very kindly volunteered to do a, kind of a hands-on lab. Would you say yeah. a couple words about that, Dan? Sure, so uh, when I gave my talk today, I alluded to a bunch of techniques that I would be happy to actually show you how to do. Um, so for example, the search by image thing I mentioned is a very, very powerful technique. And if you don't know how to do it, you need to know this. And I'll show you how to do that and how to do a bunch of other things. So I'm happy to run a workshop to drill down into these particular search techniques. And that would probably be a smaller one, but there could be several. Dan's offered to do more than one if we have interest. Again, show of hands of interest for that. Okay, <laughs> I think you're both wow. going to be busy. Super. And on the feedback form, which I, I will come back to in a moment, uh, there's a place to write in your email address. If you check the one or both that you're interested in, write your email. That way we should be able to email you if and when we have these set. Um, and if you don't have an email, then come take a look at our League of Women Voters Paul Walter website. So let me just close a couple things. We are the League, so I can't let everyone go before we just talk about our vote matters. And I think we've all seen in the news recently, even one vote can make a huge difference, especially in local elections, but just in general. So since we're here, we are the League of Women Voters. Just want to remind everyone we have a primary June 5th and the general election November 6th. And just please double check that you are registered. If you moved, you moved county, you're a new voter, whatever, please. And we do have a voter registration table out in the lobby, thanks to our, our great volunteers. So that's all I'm going to say on that one. I want to move now to the thank you. And there are a few thank yous here to make. The first is for our awesome speakers. I just thought this was so amazing. Thank you so much. And uh, Catherine and Linda and Liz are going to be handing out a little token thank you gift uh, as I'm talking. So that's what we're doing. So thank you to our speakers. Uh, second to the sponsors, the PTA Council, as I mentioned, the other League of Women Voters in the area, the AAUW, very much appreciate it. Want to also thank our Dean and Kyle. Um, I think you're up there, Kyle, and Dean is uh, around, who helped basically set up and run this wonderful venue for us, including all the technology and such. So I want to thank them very much, too. And then a special thanks to Dana, whom I mentioned at the beginning. Out of the kindness of her heart, she came and filmed this whole thing for us, so we'll be able to share it with others that couldn't come tonight. So thank you very much, Dana. And I, sorry. I should mention, and this is a plug, it is a nonprofit, it is community funded. If any feel give some money to MCV TV, please do. But anyway, thank you to Dana. 
And last but not least on the thank yous here, actually I have one personal one, and my family in the audience knows this. My mom did her, used to be very involved in community affairs, and she contributed a lot in the local community. She passed away some years ago. But I actually just want to say thanks to her, because because of her, I'm here tonight helping to do this. So anyway. <laughs> And I'd like to ask all of our uh, volunteers to please stand up for a moment. Everyone who's helped plan, organize, and staff tonight and do the tables. <laughs> and then a thank you to you. Thank you for putting up with us being a little bit late and then coming to hear about this very important topic. Very much appreciated. And on your way out, please do do the feedback form. Tell us how it was overall, whether you're interested in the two events. And then we're trying to find out how best to reach our community. And so it would be very helpful if you could check any of the ones of how did you hear about this event. So thank you again. Thank you to our fabulous speakers. It was just awesome. And thank you to you. watching MCTV, Millbrae Community Television.